Chairman, Sonicum LLC, Washington, D.C. Welcome, Mr. Shapiro. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to address you. Um, the historic expansion of global markets over the last two decades has raised the cost to American workers and American companies when certain firms erect or maintain selected barriers to open trade and investment. My remarks today focus on one important instance of this, India's weak respect for and enforcement of the intellectual property rights of U.S. companies and citizens. By a variety of measures, India has not been a responsible actor with regards to the IP rights of American companies. The widely cited Gennarde Park Index, for example, developed by the World Bank and American University, ranks India well behind many other developing nations in the enforcement of patent rights. The most recent index ranked India 42nd in the world with a score of 3.76 out of a possible five. That's basically a C grade. Um, tied with Ecuador and El Salvador, behind other developing countries such as Ukraine and Turkey. Another widely cited measure, the International Property Rights Index, created by the Property Rights Alliance, ranks India 57th in the world with regard to IP rights, far below the scores of not only the advanced countries, but also other developing countries such as Chile, Malaysia, Uruguay, Ur Uruguay Rwanda, Panama and Brazil. India's IP regime has also been evaluated by the Global Intellectual Property Rights Center of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in a 2012 study analyzing the IP regimes of four advanced economies and seven developing economies. The United States earned the highest score, 23.73 out of possible 25, while India's score of 6.24 was last lagging well behind Mexico, Chile, Malaysia, Russia, Brazil, and China. The World Economic Forum surveyed business leaders across Asia about IP rights and protections in their own nations. In that survey, India lags behind not only such countries as Taiwan, Japan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, but also Malaysia, Korea, China, and Indonesia. Finally, the U.S. Trade Representative, as you know, know very well, it issues an annual priority watch list of U.S. trading partners with the weakest IP protections and enforcement. In the 24 annual reports issued since 1989, India has been included on the priority watch list 21 of the 24 times. That's more than any other U.S. trading partner in the world. It's the worst record of any of our trading partners, according to USTR. India's current IP regime harms American companies and the economy in a number of ways. As one of the world's largest and fastest growing economies, India should provide a much larger market for U.S. exports and investments than at present. Moreover, its lax IP protections impose particular costs on the United States as compared to other countries because intellectual property is so increasingly important across the U.S. economy. With Dr. Kevin Hassett, I conducted a study in 2010, 2011 to measure the importance of intellectual property to the U.S. economy. We found that the economic value of all U.S. intellectual capital in, in 2011, and that covered patents, copyrights, databases, and brands, came to between $8.1 and $9.2 trillion. That's equivalent to over 50% of U.S. GDP. It's also equivalent to about 45 to 46 percent of all business, the stock of all business fixed investment in the United States. We also calculated that the intellectual capital of U.S. companies today accounts for more than 44 percent of their market value. Since a company's market value is closely related to how much new value it will create in the near future, we can infer that intellectual capital is the source of at least two-fifths of U.S. GDP and incomes. Actions by other countries that reduce the value of American intellectual property in their own markets, therefore, lower U.S. GDP and incomes. We also showed that in 2009, intellectual capital accounted for more than 50% of the market value of publicly traded companies in 10 different industries. 
they included not only the obvious ones, software and software services, pharmaceuticals, uh, biotech, life sciences, but also food, beverages, and tobacco, media, healthcare, equipment, and services, tele telecom services, household and personal products, consumer services, automobiles and auto components, and commercial and professional services. In all of those industries, intellectual capital represents at least 50% of their market value. Nine of those 10 IP intensive industries are also major exporters, increasing the cost to our economy when India fails to respect the, the IP rights of US companies. India's current IP regime has other adverse effects. In a recent study which I conducted with a colleague, Dr. Aparna Mather, we found a strong correlation between the quality of a nation's IP regime, as measured by the Gennar Day Park Index, and flows of foreign direct investment to that nation. Moreover, the link between a nation's respect for the IP rights of foreign companies and its FDI inflows is especially strong in highly IP intensive industries, as you would expect. We looked at the impact of India's IP regime on US FDI to India in the pharmaceutical sector. We found that if India improved its IP projections to the level of China, um, much less the United States, US FDI to India's pharmaceutical sector would increase sharply. The main beneficiary of this is India, would be India. Moreover, however, recent research has also shown that the foreign and domestic investments of US companies and the foreign and domestic employment of US-based companies complement each other. Higher FDI outflows by US companies are accompanied by higher US domestic investment and employment and wages as parent companies expand their US operations to service their expanding foreign operations. The research shows that from 1989 to 2004, a 10% increase in a multinational's F FDI was associated with a 2.6% increase in its domestic U.S. investments. A 10% increase in the wages and other compensation paid by the foreign subsidiaries of U.S. multinationals was associated with a 3.7% increase in the wages and compensation paid by those firms to their American employees. Higher FDI by American companies is also linked to higher exports by those companies to their foreign affiliates. Based on these findings, India's current IP regime has reduced the investment and compensation paid by U.S. companies in both India and the United States. Dr. Mather and I found that if India adopted IP rights and enforcement comparable to ours, US FDI to India's pharmaceutical in industry would increase threefold over the next four years, from a projected 8.8 .8 billion to more than 25 billion. We don't know how much of those projected increases in FDI to India would come out of FDI that otherwise would have gone to other countries and how much would represent an overall increase in FDI. If just one-fourth of the projected increases represent overall higher FDI, it implies an increase in U.S. pharmaceutical FDI of some four, more than $4 billion over, over four years. Um, and and if, if India adopted strict IP rights and protections, that increase in pharmaceutical FDI to India over four years, we would expect to also be accompanied by a 1.3% increase in U.S. domestic investment by pharmaceutical companies over the same period. In a global economy with fast-growing developing markets, India's current IP regime directly harms U.S. domestic investment apart from its effect on U.S. exports. We know that India is fully capable of wide-reaching reforms and improvements. They joined the WTO, they've adopted the rules of TRIPS, um, and the result has been that uh, as its Genarte Park Index rating has risen in response to these improvements, um, so has uh, FDI flows to India in a predictable correlation. Um, before they joined the WTO, total FDI to India averaged 
$650 million a year. And FDI flows in pharmaceuticals average $17 million a year. Once they entered, um, uh, these flows rose very sharply and recently, uh, from 2005 to 2013, overall FDI to India has averaged $22 billion a year and $1.2 billion in pharmaceuticals. Um, this demonstrates that India has the capacity to make substantial improvements in its intellectual property regime. With so much at stake for American companies and workers, I would urge our government to take serious steps to encourage the Indian government to reform its IP regime, or more directly, bring serious pressures to bear uh, on India's government to respect the intellectual property rights of American enterprises operating in India. Thank you.